Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whenever you're able to get this special conversation with the APA executive. My name is Dave Sweet, co-founder of ANA Psychological Accreditation, and I'm joined by Siobhan Crosby, our fellow co-founder and CEO. Bonnie, thank you for taking the time out to, to do this conversation. I know we have been running the, the series on private practice and success, and it would be kind of remiss not to include your experience in that, but we, all, we already know a large part of your story in your private practice, and the team and I felt that it was better to focus on your connection and the, the role of membership bodies or voluntary support platforms in the arena of private practice. And the only person that we could really come to speak to about it was you. So, so I want to thank you for your time. And I hope that everybody that's watching will come to appreciate why the voluntary support platform is so important. But what would you say to anybody that is currently studying about coming into private practice? I would say the most important part of creating a successful private practice is actually being self-aware because when you're self-aware you understand where you're lacking in certain things so for example i am not good technology wise so having a website designer who i trust implicitly to create my website is a much better way of dealing with the business side of things because that's not my forte so having the confidence to know what you're good at and what you're not good at what you're happy with what you're not happy with and what your abilities are and being able to outsource what you can and can't do is one of the most important things and that comes from self-awareness and confidence mm -hmm. so for me on a personal basis doing the work on ourselves during our training and onwards. It's important that therapy is not a tick box exercise. It is something that you dip in and out of whenever you want. You can have every, every childhood issue resolved within yourself, but actually having that space to go back to at any given time is really important. Mm. So for me, top of the list will always become self-awareness. That's the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Having the qualification in place is really important. Having your insurance in place is really important. Thankfully, APA provides insurance for its members where we actually get a discount, and that's holistic insurance services are absolutely brilliant. Um, also having supervision to guide you, it's, it's really important, and things have changed since my time, which makes me sound ancient. It wasn't that long ago. But the truth of the matter is having a supervisor there that you get on with, that you learn from. You know, we, we, don't, we don't step off of a platform with a certificate and know everything. It's a learning curve. Mm. So having patience with yourself but wanting to gain as much information as you can is, is, I guess, where I came from. It was a hunger to learn off my supervisor. And that meant having somebody who was much more educated and experienced than I was and me being comfortable to be taught everything that I could possibly learn from him mm. but also it's not him now it's a her fortunately Adrian Pennington is no longer with us but he taught me so so much but also we got on mm. you know and it, it does say something when you get on with your supervisor and at the end of their life you're at their deathbed the day before actually getting an opportunity to give your own goodbyes but that was that's what was our relationship and that helped me enormously yeah. and also you know it's a, it's a bit like following the therapeutic process our role is to connect with the client and to create create a space for them that they feel safe they feel valued they feel appreciated they feel heard they feel worthy of being there a lot of people really, really struggle 
with believing that they're worthy enough to even have therapy. You know, it's almost like oh, my life wasn't that bad, so why am I here? And other people have had it so bad. And that's called ignoring their own feelings. And that's called dismissing the repercussions of what's ever happened to them because it's not a competition. But in truth, that space is imperative for most people, but it is setting the conditions. It's having the kind of character and that character is very important as a therapist because it's about accepting everybody that sits in front of you. But it's also about weaving between each person because not one person, can, you can't work with one person necessarily in the same way that you can work with somebody else. Mm. So you have to be very aware of the nuances of how somebody is presenting to you. And that takes experience and that takes intuition and that takes the knowledge that you gain through your training, your supervision, and your own experiences. Mm. It's really important to acknowledge we can have a lifetime of experiences and they're very important. Mm. And for, for anyone that is kind of going through training at the moment, there is a big question around the role of the voluntary support platforms. And, and what would you say to, um, to individuals currently sitting in that, but also, bearing in mind that we are going to be having conversations with education professionals within the world of mental health later in the series what would what would you say to to the education arena i would say to the education arena firstly it's not up to anybody to coerce anybody to attach themselves to anyone in particular in my day we were given the information we were allowed to make autonomous choices Unfortunately, maybe those autonomous, autonomous choices weren't as informed as what they could have been. And as a trainee, you know, there's a huge power dynamic between a lecturer giving you your qualification and being a student. So you tend to go with what you don't know and what you're told. So I would say to any student out there, look for an organisation that actually is supportive of you. Look for where you want to attach yourself that you're going to get something back from that is relevant to you and important to you and supports you. I've been attached to other memberships. I know what we're doing with APA is completely different to any other organisation out there. That's what I'm very proud of, because when people look at the benefits that they get out of APA, then I can sincerely say, in comparison to any other membership organisation, they're incomparable. Mm. But for me, I would say research, research, and don't just take what you hear as an automatic given. We know that things in the student world are becoming very, very, very muddied and coercive. It is so important for all trainees to have the awareness to know that there are other organizations out there and to research those organizations and make the choice that they want rather than feel forced to do anything yeah and we have heard of institutions that are mandating affiliation in order to study and and that's something that sits outside the, the realms of voluntary support platforms in any other arena isn't it Yes, it's actually really sad because truth be told, it's almost like starting the therapeutic relationship and learning about the therapeutic relationship through coercion and control of a system that goes against everything that's the been very principle. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. So when I sit there and reflect and I think I feel quite fortunate that when I did my studying, I really didn't have that that kind of dynamic going on. But I am hearing it more and more and more from students that are told you have to be this and you have to pay this to get where you need to go. And mm -hmm. it's quite heartbreaking because it's seeing a profession, one profession in this country being dictated to in relation to starting training. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's really sad, but it's also dangerous. And it also can breed resentment in the student from the word go, because they're literally being forced down a route that they don't even really understand why. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, you know, there are there are courses, and to play devil's advocate, there are courses within the education arena that are attached to regulated sectors. If you wanted to do nursing, for example, you would have to affiliate to the um, the various associations and governing regulatory bodies for nursing. Now that's completely logical. A government decision has been made, but that's not the case with counselling and psychotherapy, is it? No, unfortunately, nobody wants to openly admit, apart from ourselves, consistently and repeatedly, that there is no governing body in this country. So having a, an entire system and framework, which is actually very, very clever for the company themselves, set up to make people believe a persona that is completely false, but also coerce students down that particular road themselves, also recruiters down that particular road. And the more people that understand that their responsibility without doing the research actually leads to people dying. And I will say this time and time and time again, because that is exactly what is happening in this country. And we know that it's because people are being forced to join organizations, which when you think of voluntary and forced, they're, they, they're, it's an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it's, you know, I, I use the analogy of military intelligence. They're per both perfectly apt at what they do, but don't put them together. Um, the, the, the sense that, we are mandating students into those bottlenecks, reinforces the, the mandatory for recruitment. And again, as, as you say, that's costing lives because we see only about 20% of all qualified professionals meet that requirement. And actually it's a false persona of a requirement because the best therapist is the therapist that is self-aware. The least effective therapist is somebody that can fill out a lot of really good forms, but actually can't even create a relationship, mm -hmm. you know, or hasn't worked on their self-awareness. And none of that, that's not evidence-based. Mm -hmm. So when you've got no evidence of somebody's self-awareness, but they're great at filling out forms, well, that's helpful, not. Yeah. Pay, pay your money, get your badge, and go out and start cutting people with the invisible scalpel of psychology. Um, whereas what you and I have created it is a very different model um, in its approach, but it's also a much more in line approach to the therapeutic process itself, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we're not here to kind of assess somebody's self-awareness by judging them, but you can tell an awful lot about somebody that is just willing to pick up the phone and actually have a conversation. Mm -hmm. You can tell an awful lot about somebody that thinks that they might be judged and yet still takes the risk of picking up the phone and putting themselves in that position. Mm -hmm. You can tell an awful lot about somebody when they simply communicate with you. And if they're communicating effectively and healthily and from a place of self-awareness, you, you can tell an experienced yeah. therapist can see and hear and recognize and work with. And the most important thing for me is it's not about what a lot of people, we've had a lot of feedback about how can you judge self-awareness on somebody? Well, actually the fact that that's even being said tells me something. So <laughs> every assessor that goes through our assessment program to ensure that they earn out of their membership are people that have already been through that assessment themselves. So it, it's not a, this person is so self-aware that they've become the latest guru on the planet. It's not, it's not that way, and we're not thinking that way. Mm. It's about this person has the courage to pick up the phone and sit with what they don't know, which is what every time a brand new person comes into your room for therapy, 
you might have had the initial conversation with them and they might well have said, I want to come because I've got anxiety or depression. And these are symptoms of something underneath. Mm. I don't get into that on the phone with what's the underneath stuff until that person is sitting in front of me. Mm. So, but I don't know what that underneath stuff is. Mm. So I have to sit with not knowing and I have to sit with my own knowledge coming through and the knowledge that that client gives me over what has happened to them. So mm -hmm. we've echoed and consciously echoed the entire therapeutic process in every vein that runs through Upper's blood. Mm -hmm. For me, that's something that will always make me smile because any really experienced therapist, they can see how we've woven the awareness through. They can see the importance of that. Yeah. One of the things that I think, you know, it still touches me when we have members that are have gone through that assessment process. They've gone through the 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 building the assessment so that they can then carry out those assessments. Because you don't do those assessments at all, do you? No, because in the world of therapy, which is ironically one of the most judgmental places to actually exist in, one, that I've become drawn and quartered, and I'm fully aware of that fact, and secondly, might be so, there would be a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I would automatically be accused of bringing in all my friends. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, this is an ethical organisation that des deserves the recognition, in my opinion, of doing things in a way that is ethical, that is responsible, that doesn't create conflict of interest, yeah. and that actually recognises that, yes, I am the head of this company. And I say that in inverted commas because we work very much as a team, but I know how much work that you do, yeah. and I know how much work I do, but often it's very different work that we're doing and it just comes together a bit like a jigsaw. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, I wouldn't dream of being an assessor because it's totally inappropriate. Yeah, you know? and, so, and this is where the, the, the team that do those conversations, near enough every time they've done one, they've come back to us and said how much they've enjoyed that engagement. But also the member, who starts off quite anxious about the process, uh, about the, the whole interaction, but within minutes, they're at ease and the conversation is flowing and it's something that they've not experienced before. In, in the way of APA, no, you're right. But ironically, they're only echoing what they do regularly. And that's the point. We look for quality over quantity. We look for qualified over unqualified. We look for ethical over unethical. We look for awareness over lack of awareness. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind, you know, we can't, we don't expect everybody to know everything. What we do is hope that they have the confidence to actually say, I don't know what the answer to that is, but can you help me out? That's what is a major part of our assessment process is, is completely about the confidence to say, I don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you think, when you go back to the stories that we hear about students in classrooms and they talk about the child that keeps quiet and the child that doesn't have the confidence to say, I don't know. Yet the confidence, there has to be a level of confidence in the therapeutic setting within the therapist. Now, it might not start off like that because confidence comes from experience. Mm. But when that confidence grows and develops, I would sincerely hope that as they are able to interact with any client, they're able to interact with anybody. Yeah. And that's part of the process. So I suppose the you know, app has made huge waves and a massive amount of progress over the last three years in highlighting the, the restrictive recruitment. We've, we've now got the, the dossier on positive mental health in front of cabinet officials in both Edinburgh and in London. We've got parliamentary 
um, representatives that are supporting that end of the bottleneck um, campaign. But what do you see as the key components for a professional to ensure that they are affiliated to a voluntary support platform? Well, I think the importance for me is being able to say to somebody in front of you, if you are unhappy with anything that I do, you have somewhere to go to to tell somebody about that. Because it's for me, it, it gives an added element of security. Now, in the current systems, I can honestly say that I, I really do, and I'm saying it as bluntly as I can in the mood that I'm actually in right now. I can honestly say complaints feel very often despairingly pointless. Whereas actually, we're an organisation that wants to hear the truth about what people are going through and we want to deal with that truth if it comes in and we want to help whoever it is both parties concerned because it's a very difficult thing to go through mm -hmm. what we won't do is dismiss people and what we won't do is ignore complaints and let's be honest APA so far has probably the best record on the planet right now because for a company that's been going for three years we've not had one so when you look at it like that Yes, our members are growing, and yes, we are a young company at toddler stage, in my opinion, but our ideas and our objectives are adult-like, and they're determined, and they are fruitful, and they will work, and the more people come to us, the more they'll realise that actually we're looking for the best for clients, and we're also willing to give the best we can to our members. Yeah. And in supporting our members, I think it's it's probably worth pointing out that as a voluntary support platform, APA is the only organisation that supports its members when it's making complaints external to, to APA. Because it's important for any member to feel like they have somewhere to go to. You know, we see it every single day. I know, as I say this, there isn't one person out there that will disagree with me, right down to the way our switchboard works. We don't even have a switchboard. That's the point. You know, if I ring up BT or if I ring up any organisation on the planet, you have to go through, and I understand why they do it, you mm -hmm. have to go through loophole after loophole, digit after digit, and sometimes you can be on the phone for five minutes and you're going round and round and round. From the word go, we want human connections. So for me personally, having somebody feel safe, secure, but make it easily accessible, it drives me crazy when I'm trying to get hold of somebody in a company and you can't find their email address. You there is no public number available. There's multiple hoops to get through. There's been companies that have actually given up trying to get through to the person who's ironically, and I'm thinking of one particular situation with one particular health organization, that getting hold of the clinical manager is literally pointless. You mm -hmm. cannot, and that's not a CEO, and that's not an MD, and that's not a co-founder. That's a departmental manager that you cannot get hold of yeah. and they do not return your calls. Yeah. And when you have a company that runs like that, it's not reflective of good practice. Yeah. Whereas having a support platform for our members to do with external complaints as well as internal ones, it's, it's the, the sense of being held and contained and feel like you matter. That's what we want for our members, that they, because they actually do matter. And I, and I suppose it would be a shock to, to a lot of people in the field that not only do we have Open Contact Thursday, which is, you know, in, in my mind, is a phenomenal means of access to, to the executive. But we also carry out courtesy calls to our members on a routine basis, don't we? We do, and we will continue to do this because business is about relationships in the same way that the therapeutic business thrives on great relationships. If you haven't got a great relationship with your client, there's something wrong. 
mm. you know, and it, it's up to two people to work together in the same way that we're an organization run by people. So we work with people. Mm. It's a bit like um, what amuses me, and I've seen this more than once. We now have robots asking the humans whether or not they're actually human. <laughs> you know, and, and and when you start seeing that kind of dynamic, you start realizing where a lot of companies are losing their humanity within their human side of being because everything's so electronic. Mm. Well, you know what? Electronics are absolutely brilliant in so many ways, but to get through and connect with a person who actually wants to be there and support you. It, it just changes the entire dynamic of a company relationship. And that's that's something that's different to any organisation out there. So I'm pleased to put my Thursdays aside and make that, if you like, completely focus on APA and APA's members and anything that they need. Because if I don't put the work into it, well, what's it's kind of, we coexist with our members. Mm. If I remove that coexistence, then it doesn't work for the company. And, it, and it, it has to come from a genuine place. And this is the part that I get really quite passionate about. It has to be genuine. You cannot go into a relationship with people, no matter what relationship it is, mm. without being genuine, without having integrity, without having honesty, without having transparency. You put that, it's, it's like the house that has the strongest foundation. When you have cement at the ground, chances are the house will stay up when the storm comes to hit it. Hmm. If it's made of sand, then it will waver and fall and probably collapse with a big strong wind. Yeah. The matter is, this is that we're working on a completely different ethos, which is following the ethical process and running it through the veins of Africa, And it works. And um, I want to kind of touch on the the future um, we know that the the questions around regulation are are growing louder and louder um, and we know that the political entities that will finally make those decisions are are looking at that almost on an annual basis now aren't they they are and um, they've needed they needed, it's a little bit like a political party. They needed a new breath of fresh air to show an ethos of difference and growth and change. They have needed that. They've now got that. And when they've got that, they start looking at the other parties, if you like, and start thinking, okay, well, that one might have been around for a long time, but actually, Old dogs struggle with new tricks so maybe it's the new dog that you need to let in because the new one has some real good tricks in here mm. and for me there is a lot of talk politically at the moment because mental health since the pandemic it's it's been as much as it was an explosion with a virus it was an explosion of mental health recognition you know and it's quite sad that it's taken till the year 2022 for people to really realize that the muscle that is their brain actually impacts on them. I mean, it helps us walk, talk, it helps us eat, sleep, it helps us exercise, it helps us do everything. But somehow, somehow there's been something along the way that says that it doesn't really exist, you know, yeah, as, as, as long as the pharmaceutical industry can intersect the message and, and make the physical different, then, you know, we'll, we'll go along with that. And I think that has definitely kind of taken a big hit on in the last two years. I think, you know, we, we said it right at the very beginning of, of 2020 that we have got to look at the pandemic as an amplifier it has shown us everything, good, bad, and indifferent, in so much clearer view that we've got to start working at putting things in that are fit for purpose. And the mental health system, in all frankness, in 2019, was anything but fit for purpose. It's not really going 
to to stand up to the impact of the pandemic if we don't change it and that's the whole point you know one of the reasons why apple was created because i'm fully aware of the system so are you we know that those systems are actually preventing the right help getting to the right people Mm. and you know it it's actually really heartbreaking because a lot of people come to me individually with what's going on in their lives mm-hmm. and it it the past week i i've found it absolutely tragic that so many people are dying literally either taking their own lives because they can't get the access and mm-hmm. and there it's a factual situation mm-hmm. there are there are people that might walk into my office and say well i tried to set up therapy with my doctor and there's there's a a 14 week wait and that's a 14 week wait not for therapy that's a 14 week wait for somebody to say they can have therapy or not mm-hmm. and then another six yeah. months can go, and you sit there and you think the ironic thing about this is if the powers that be actually appreciated the power of real appropriate mental health services and gave people the access they needed to achieve what they need to do backed up by good therapeutic help the millions ironically it would save and that's the bit that i Mm. struggle with getting across the message of the finances that the government would actually save Mm. in the long run and and it's it's kind of frightening in the sense that we are seeing the the projects that that APA have been involved in from the the post-trauma care response framework for the NHS at the beginning of the pandemic, the 115 project with mental health change. And we're seeing the evolution internationally of those systems and then being brought into practice overseas. But the UK will still sit with its traditional failed voluntary support platforms that have misled and knowingly misled the public and the political arena. Yeah, and and that's the sad part, but I have hope because I know that what happens in America often at leads to the UK. App has already created that in collaboration. And when I start seeing America start advertising individual mental health telephone numbers for their own public, I know, I know somewhere along the line, some bright spark who's paid a good bit of money to be in politics will sit there and think, hmm, this isn't a bad idea. Actually, this company has already offered us a solution to this. It will happen. I absolutely believe it will happen. Unfortunately, it's a bit like banging on a wall until the wall actually falls down, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's hard for me because I work with trauma every single day. So I inevitably hear the stories every single day. You know, I, I hear, I, I see even organisations that will only take therapists from certain other organisations that are voluntary yet the ethical guidelines attached to the voluntary organisation that they're taking professionals from are not actually adhered to in the company that's taking those people on, mm. you know. So when you see, I mean, most professionals know the guide, the guide to even seeing clients is in between 20 and 25 max a week, 25 appointments, absolute max per week. There's a reason for that. Then you see organisations taking a therapist and employing them and asking them to do 40 hours a week. And you sit there and you think, how does this work when actually you're doing this because of the ethics of that organisation, yet you're going against the ethics that you took these professionals from? And it needs exposing. It is corruption. I will name this as corruption. It was a brilliant idea for somebody once upon a time to go, this company can make millions and this is how we do it. Well, you know what, they've done it. But in the process of that, they're, in my opinion, really responsible for the damage that's going on in the NHS and the problems that have been occurred through waiting lists and people dying. Yeah. So 
ultimately as an organization moving past our third birthday you are you are looking at a different world when you look at what APA is is framing for the future of mental health because ironically as you said when we work with clients we help them learn a different world a different world in their mind that they never ever knew a lot of the time even exists mm. and they grow within that mind and they develop within that mind and through the magic of those processes and changes they create a new life for themselves in how they react how they communicate how they respond what they what boundaries they put in place all those things that are amazing about the therapeutic process and what it helps create APA is doing exactly the same thing it is like being in a different world but a world that promotes the authenticity and integrity of excellent therapists and for the doors to be opened to ensure that the people that need them which in my opinion is practically everybody you know therapy is not just about going and trying to deal with trauma therapy can be simply a space where you feel heard and understood and during the process of that can change somebody's reactions to so much you know it, it's too big a context to put into how therapy is so useful but it is life-changing yeah or and, and, and i will add because this is where i love the power of therapy when you have an adult that comes in and works with you and they have children they have children they learn to start teaching the children that they've got a different, healthier, more self-aware way of being. They help the child hold on to what the child already has, which is awareness. Children have more awareness than most adults. Mm -hmm. The child is the one that will say, I feel hurt, I feel angry, I feel sad. Whereas the adult will go, I've been thinking of doing this. And they miss the feeling within their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And for me my proudest my proudest feelings in my own work as a professional is knowing that the adults that i work with transcend their education and their understanding towards their own children for the next generation mm. and there isn't anything more powerful on the planet than creating a generation of self-aware children that become the adults they were always meant to be and that for me is the power of amazing therapy so if we were to put a call to action or a, a series of calls to action, what would you like people to, to do from on the back of hearing this conversation? Unfortunately, I'm going to start with the first one, which is a, from a completely biased perspective, join APA. <laughs> join APA and understand what you're getting from an organisation that truly, truly believes in the power of really good therapy. Join an organisation where you're going to be accepted for who you are. We have different ways of doing our assessments. We take into account neurodivergency. We take into account all different ways of people needing help in relation to filling out an application form. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is ask, you know, ask and we will help. That's our ethos. And truth be told, I believe that the more we work at recognising the power of actually removing a closed shop approach from the world of therapy and recognise the qualifications that people have gained, recognise that most people come into this world from a place of being wounded themselves, you need to seal your wounds. And when I mean seal them, I mean process what's within them, go through them and heal yourself via your own journey because the power of doing that will lead you to be the best kind of therapist for the person that sits in front of you. And the more people that have success in therapy, the more people that will teach the next generation and along the lines it will go. So for me personally, Join us, help us achieve something that no other organisation wants to achieve. But we understand the ethos, we appreciate the ethos, and it absolutely needs to change for the sake of everybody in the UK at the moment in particular. Well, thank you for that. 
I think from from me, I would probably just add that the the close shop recruitment that has been in place now for the best part of twenty years has catastoric catastrophically destroyed the mental health system. It's it's removed the capacity of 80% of qualified professionals to, to work. And that has never been mandated by government. That's simply been because voluntary support platforms have asserted themselves as some form of authority above that of a voluntary support platform. The only way that changes is for NICE to acknowledge that there is no governing body in the world of mental health. That restriction that is applied by NICE is stopping the NHS from filling thousands of jobs every year. Jobs that are paid for, jobs that have already got the revenue in the bank for. So this isn't about funding, this is about allowing that funding to be used but is being blocked unless those individual professionals pay a charity. And as Vonnie said, that's corruption. NICE can change that and it can change it in the stroke of a pen, the butt press of a button. It can remove that mandation. The health secretary can make that happen at the stroke of a pen, at a push of a button. Send the email, remove the mandation of affiliation to a voluntary support platform as a criteria for employment. And you will fill those jobs. You will reduce your waiting lists. You will save lives. And you will create a country that works from a place of self-awareness that functions in a much better way, which will reduce the impact on the judicial system. It will reduce the impact on the education system. It would reduce the impact on the unemployment system. It would reduce the impact on social services. It would reduce the impact on mental health services. And that's the irony. The millions, the trillions, I can't even put a figure to it, would be saved over a period of time. And as a human race, it is our job to appreciate we are a whole being. We don't work from the neck down. We work from the top of our heads to the tip of our toes. And it's important to appreciate all in between. And the more people that have the awareness to actually understand, because everything comes from education, the more those politicians are educated to fully appreciate even the reasons why they've striven for the power that they've got in their own hands, but to use their power wisely to use it for the good of the position that they required for the people that they represent that's what actually matters in this country get that on board everything else will sort itself out in the most amazing of ways because it does well von again it's been an absolute pleasure to spend time with you I'm sure most people will appreciate these are the kinds of conversations that you and I have behind closed doors on a frequent basis. So it's great to be able to, to kind of open it up and share this with, with more people. But last word to you, what would you like to, to say to anyone that is considering reaching out for therapeutic support? I would say go to our directory, pick somebody on there, let them work with you, because they are what I consider the best of the best. Not because they've got 28 degrees, but because they understand themselves and they have the experience and qualifications to help understand you. And by understanding you, you learn to understand yourself in a much better way. And that is the magic of therapy. Go to Rapper pick a brilliant therapist and watch your life take a turn that you never in a billion years could expect it to take because that is the power of self-awareness. That's what I'd say. I've got a lump in my throat.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Von. For anybody that has watched today, if you have gained anything that is going to support you or your practice or your career, then you can get CPD certificate for this time. What you need to do is fill out the questionnaire online, get that back to us, because APA believes that CPD should be validated. Nobody should be given recognition for watching something that they didn't actually benefit from. So the public know that when you present a CPD from APA, that that CPD had benefit to you and to your clients. So for now, once again, the ethos of therapy. I'm going to leave it on this one point because I had a very last appointment today and it's a very good way of ending this particular video. They say in private practice that you cannot have a record of somebody's progress. I'm going to refrain from using my cultural Irish language here which is really quite brutal and really quite blunt. It's so I'm going to be polite. It's rubbish. You can represent the quality of progress on paper in a private practice. We are following the ethos of the therapeutic process. And as I said before, it runs through our veins to evidence our work, to evidence our members' work, to make it an ethical process. And I think if we carried on, we could talk about things that I was an hour and a half, but we're not going to. We are going to leave it there. But I do want to invite people to come and look at our website, www.ayanay.co.uk. There's a dot after the three W's, by the way. And furthermore, if you want to contact us directly, 0208 556 4984. We will return your call. We're here to help you as much as we ask you to help us change the systems. So thank you and take care. From me and from her, take care. Good night. Good night.